Um, Reggie, <laughs> we have you here because, A, we are extremely impressed with uh, uh, your video, stuff we've read, seen, heard, and um, we know that there's an impending economic collapse, as there was in 2008. You're one of the few people who predicted that collapse. Um, you're one of the few black folks that predicted that collapse. Um, and so we want to pick your brain, for lack of a better term, um, see if what we're seeing is what you're seeing or vice versa. Show us, you know, um, or tell us some things that you see impending on the horizon. Um, I know that you do a lot of stuff with Bitcoin um, and you have way more knowledge than us on Bitcoin. We are, we can spell Bitcoin. So that, that's as far as our knowledge goes. So um, on that note, I want to turn this over to you to talk about the socioeconomic blue, I mean, boot camp that you're talking about. Okay. okay. Well, um, we already we covered already on the topic. topic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's uh, start with uh, my outlook on uh, economic. Uh, when you say economic collapse, that's, you know, it's good. It sounds good. But it's uh, a little dramatic. I'd say, oh, I see. Basically, if you take a ball, up in the air, certain um, contingent of team uh, in economic um, people. Who hey, Reggie, Reggie, you're kind of going in and out. I don't know why, but your, your volume is kind of going in and out. Okay, how's this? Is this better? Yep. Okay. So, um, if you think of a ball, um, if you take a ball, you in the air, there's a certain contingent of um, economists who believe that the ball will stay there in perpetuity. Or just stays there. Now, I'm not, probably not as wise as you guys are, but you know, my personal experience is it's going to go up 100% of the time. 100 for something. So that's what happened with the other You had um, fundamental reasons for lots of real estate to increase, particularly for the same thing. Seven One of those reasons was gentrification on economic social economic who's into an area. Usually, this place is a lot of people think of things which is bad. We are in this place, especially in our such as Latinos, Jews, etc. That's not necessarily the case. It is basically not necessarily fast going down or up. So, we had a lot of urban areas in the U.S in the Harvard yeah, area. Uh, I go down there now, the way we have nice in the 1980s, in New York, all over Brooklyn, downtown Brooklyn, we flat push in the general, in the area of Miami, Manhattan, Dallas, you mix this gentrification with credit card, credit card, basically, credit card, by banks, and it's very low, and um, a lot of um, you had a bubble, you had fundamentals, you had um, which was the result of low interest, rent significantly above fundamental especially with thinking to be able if, if rents rent are up, up, if people are making money, money prices should go up. If supply should go up. Now, now when, when prices price of housing, you build for affordable housing, it should be a 
put in this bubble. I'm going to collapse. Blah, 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 blah. Now, in fact, this is happening about now. Um, it was easy. I mean, everybody was with it. My, at the time, my son was eight years old. He asked me, um, so he asked me, but I was I'm going to be on the other So, from 2000, we're not now. 68. We're all right. Exact same thing. You still have... Uh, everybody in the world. And the world over there. Have interest rates. If you really have support for you. Straight to negative. All countries are much more negative. Um, one in five years. Negative interest rates. It's the antithesis. Basically, I borrow money from you. You have to pay me for that. So, how do you do business? Money is not free. Take long long. You lose. If you're penalized, you take a law, I'm going to put a lot, and you spend it invest it in You know, that may or may not be the it all this is because take it. This is guaranteed to be You know, they'll grow up since I And their solution was more dead. Interestingly enough, it's more than a big mistake. So, the end of the third collapse, and I correct me, something was wrong, and I'm on a negative interest rate, it's really bad. For the moment, yeah. <laughs> so, the uh, top of socioeconomic, economic, basically, uh, as, as it's, you know, played on its face, the uh, position then that enables you to control all of the um, social, whatever we call uh, definition of and someone's so as an individual, what you pay, etc. A good 
socioeconomic status or socioeconomics or class to my children. I take um, two individuals from the black community that are well known, okay? And a lot of people confuse class or socioeconomic status with money, particularly income, okay? Number one, when you are wealthy, wealthy primarily, especially among truly wealthy people, denotes a lot of equity. In other words, a lot of assets minus a lot of debt and which you have less of equity. A large amount of equity is wealthy. Uh, those who are not part of the higher socioeconomic strata or the higher class believe that um, wealth equals income, and that's not true. To give you an example, some of the wealthiest um, families in this country or in the world actually have very little income, unless you have uh, ongoing concern as a business, as an asset in family. A lot of the wealth is tied up in real estate, which significant amount of non-producing um, uh, assets, commodities, gold, diamonds, etc., cetera, um, paintings. This stuff doesn't throw off income, but they're still very wealthy. You can have five, six hundred, seven hundred million dollars, a billion dollars in wealth, and especially with very, very low income um, interest rates right now, you can have the income of somebody who has a blue-collar job, a police officer, etc. But one is significantly more wealthy than the other. Okay, so that's to clarify once one misunderstanding or misconception. Another one is that wealth in general, whether it's income or assets minus liabilities, which equals equity, um, denotes socioeconomic status or class. You know, absolute nonsense. We take Lil Wayne, okay, and I'm a hip hop dude. I love hip hop. You know, grew up in New York, you know, 80s from the beginning, rocking and everything. So I'm true hip hop. Um, I also believe personally hip hop has died off, but, you know, what we have now is pop music, but that's a different conversation for another day. Okay, so we have Lil Wayne, popular dude, um, has to have quite a few million dollars on his belt. Let's assume he's worth 30, 40, 50, 60 million dollars. Okay, let's pick one of those nominally. Okay, at the very least, he should be worth 15 to 20 million. Okay, let's compare him to Barack Obama. Barack Obama has a net worth maybe of about three or four, maybe eight million dollars. Okay, his income is significantly lower than Lil Wayne's. His net worth is significantly lower than Lil Wayne's. His total assets are significantly lower, lower than Lil Wayne's. As a matter of fact, I'm sure if you go on Twitter, he probably has less followers than Lil Wayne, believe it or not. Who do you think has the highest economic strat, socioeconomic class by far? Barack Obama. The reason? Barack Obama has significantly more control over his future and destiny than Lil Wayne. As a matter of fact, Barack Obama has significantly more control over the future and destiny of most people on this entire planet. So his socioeconomic status is high, probably the maximum. Any sitting U.S. president, at least until the fall of the republic and or until Trump gets elected, you know, a little side joke, right, <laughs> um, <laughs> has uh, more socioeconomic uh, standing than probably any other entity or person on the planet. You know, second runner results would be the you know, chairman of the U.S. Fed, uh, the chairman of the ECB, the Pope, etc. Each and every one of these individuals had less money than Eddie Murphy, than Michael Jordan, than Lil Wayne, Birdman, Jay-Z, etc., Beyonce. Okay, so it takes a whole lot more than money and wealth to gain and attain socioeconomic status. Now, I can go off on a tangent on this and go through... Um, what sources of wealth and income um, are most likely to assist you in gaining a higher socioeconomic status. But in a nutshell, it's definitely not the entertainment industry. It's not the media industry. Um, as of right now, finance and technology. 
and as of the near future, it'll be finance and technology. With finance about to go through a structural and cyclical downturn. Okay, and technology about to go through a structural and cyclical upturn. And that brings us on to the next topic of uh, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, and blockchain technology. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. I have about 10 more minutes. So I'll tell you a quick story of uh, a technology that came into play. Um, it's been around the underlying technology. The protocols have been around for a long time or had been around for a long time. But it started becoming popularized by um, uh, young, educated white men. Um, and it was a protocol-based platform. Uh, when it first came about, when it first started becoming you by young, educated white men demographic, of which I'd say 92% of the users are part of that demographic. Um, it was believed to be a nerd fad for programmers, hackers, um, users of porn, criminals, etc. And that was true. But be aware that users of porn, nerds, hackers, and criminals are the largest consumers of bleeding edge technology there is. Every technology, Betamax, um, you know, rubber bands, VHF radio, ham radio, etc. You know, that's what they do. So as it became more and more popular, it started catching on to the mainstream, investors started pouring in, venture capitalists started pouring in, and the world started relying more and more on this technology. Okay, you fast forward a few years, the entire world relies on this technology. Everybody relies on it. As a matter of fact, those who are born into the technology don't even know life without it. You have to be roughly about our age, maybe a little younger, to even recognize life without it. Now, what is that technology? That technology became popularized in 1993. It's called the Internet. That's how we're communicating right now. I doubt if any of you have ever woken up on any day and not used anything that was connected to the Internet, a single thing. Okay? The Bitcoin blockchain network, public network, and the Bitcoin protocol is essentially Internet 2.0, where the Internet protocol, which is called IP or TCP IP, is a protocol-based um, network that allows frictionless transfer of information packets, little tiny bits of information. These information packets can carry almost anything. It, right now, I'm using it through a handheld computer, which is more powerful than the mainframes of eight years ago, more powerful than PCs of four years ago. I'm using it to spread this video conversation with, it looks like only eight people, but it could be you know hundreds of millions. Um, I'm using it to communicate video, audio, and textually. And I use it for email to send documents. I use it for everything. Very, very powerful. And I'm paying very, very little for it. The Bitcoin protocol, the Bitcoin platform, allows the same transfer. But instead of bits and packets of information, Bitcoin allows for the seamless, risk-free, zero-trust transfer of value. Now, most people think of value as money, and Bitcoin can transfer money like it's nothing. But it also transfers all value, or anything that you would consider valuable. In doing this, it allows um, Nancy to do business with Paul without knowing Paul, without trusting Paul, without knowing who Paul is, and Paul cannot cheat Nancy. Okay, They can enter into a smart contract, which is a computerized version of a social agreement or a legal contract, but smart contracts are self-executing. Uh, they're unbreachable and unbreakable, and they're transparent for all to see the terms. This is a new way of doing business. You can send value and money from point A to point B for pennies, or not even a full penny. So you're talking 99% cheaper than Western Union. You can send it all over the world. This money has its own rails. So it's like having a car. Imagine buying a car, and that car comes with its own streets. And these streets can go anywhere in the world, across state borders, geographic country borders, across rivers, lakes, mountains, everywhere there's an internet connection. And it runs 24 hours a day. And you don't have to pay for gas. You pay roughly two cents for every trip whether that trip is from here to your next door neighbor's house or from here to the other side of the world. That car can carry any value that you want, whether it's one penny or $100 million, all for that same couple of pennies uh, transmission costs. And the trip is instantaneous. And that trip can't be hacked. 
and can't be stolen without your permission, as long as you follow prudent rules of keeping your password safe, etc. How much would that car be worth to you? A lot, hopefully. Okay, that's a quick rundown of what the Bitcoin platform is and Bitcoin. Now, I've dropped all my businesses. I've taken, you know, hell of risk. Um, didn't seem so smart at certain times, but um, I've created a startup based upon smart contracts, blockchain technology, and Bitcoin public blockchain. Um, it took two years for me to develop uh, the pitch and the story to explain it like I've been explaining it just now and to develop the technology of which we have patent applications out. I plan to use this technology to allow everybody to do business as if they were Goldman Sachs, everybody. So that nine-year-old girl in Sri Lanka who was normally marginalized and not even thought of, um, well, let me not be too draconian, marginalized and not thought of by many, say, Goldman Sachs proprietary desk traders can literally sit down and trade against them directly, um, 18 cents at a time. But that 90 year old girl in Sri Lanka, breaking a lot of uh, stereotypical consensus, is a mathematical genius. And her family owns a small rice farm, and she knows um, rice prices, commodity growing seasons, and she trades commodities 18 cents at a time with an algorithm that she wrote. And she beats these traders six out of nine trades. And her algorithm slices and dices uh, rice commodities every, you know, 45 milliseconds. And with that one 18 cents, she makes $15 a day, every day, day in and day out. With every computer she has running, she has a few of them. That nine-year-old girl now takes her intellectual capital, which is superior to many others, but marginalized because it's behind this glass ceiling of access to capital, access to infrastructure, access to um, communication. And through this network, is able to take capital from those who deserve it less because even though they had it, they didn't have the intellectual capacity to keep it in true competition. She rises up the socioeconomic ladder, right? And by default, anybody who rises up the socioeconomic ladder, by default, displaces somebody else because this ladder is not static. It's all dynamic and moving. So if there's three of us in a room, okay, and I have $45 billion, but you have $55 billion, and the other guy has $65 billion. I'm poor. You know, just because I have $45 billion doesn't mean I'm wealthy. You know, I remember my oldest son asked me if we were wealthy or not. And I told him, or asked if we were rich or not when he was young. And I said, well, that really depends on how wealthy our neighbor is or how poor our neighbor is. So, you know, we got 45 cents in a chicken bone. But, you know, the guy next door has 10 cents in no chicken bone. You know, <laughs> real might as well be Bill Gates. So it's not about how much you have. It's about where you stand relative to what everybody else has or doesn't have. So that 10-year-old and 9-year-old in Sri Lanka can use her own intellectual capacity to move up social economic ladder. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and pass those who, from a meritorious perspective, didn't deserve to be where they are. So this story is not well loved by everybody, but I like it. And it's part of the regime that I'm trying to bring them for. Now, those who have access to capital and truly deserve it from a meritorious perspective get the move even higher. Uh, in a nutshell, we went through a quick crash course on the macro environment in the world as I see it, uh, social economics, and Bitcoin blockchain. I have two minutes left. Yo, any questions for me? Go ahead, Eric. I know Rich, you have a question. Me, Rich, can you hear me? Go ahead. Uh, well, I see we there's a question off to the right uh, from at B Moore LLC, uh, and he stated, I'm wondering if that view of constantly comparing ourselves to others leads us to have more of the crab mentality. Just a thought. Your your answer. Okay. Well, yeah, you have to define exactly what a crab mentality is, but before we even get to that definition, um, Society in itself is a comparison to everybody else. You know, you yourself is a comparison to others. You don't know who you are without comparing to others. For instance, are you short or tall? You have no it idea. It depends on who I'm standing next to when I decide. 
to know who you're standing with, you have to compare. You know, a sense of self is relative to everybody else. There's nothing wrong with looking at others, in my opinion. As a matter of fact, you cannot know where you stand without comparison to something else. Is somebody slow or fast? Are they short or tall? You know, are you, you know, dark or light? You know, any characteristic is what it is on its own. But to be um, judged or measured, it has to be compared to something else. Think of the theory of relativity. Relativity. There we go. <laughs> okay, and then uh, uh, I guess, uh, and be more chimed in, what I mean by crab mentality is the idea that the only way to get ahead is that I need to pull someone else down. Yeah, well, see, that's not what I said, though. The only way to get ahead is to move ahead. But if you move ahead, you just pay somebody else. Now, you could take, there are two ways you could look. You could take ethics and morals out, but it's not necessary to take ethics and morals out. If you do your best, okay, and you do your best without attempting to hurt others, the person you displace does not belong where they were. That's why they were displaced in the first place. You have a job. Now you have a job, there's only two of you in a job. Okay, it's a small company, right? You bust your butt, you work hard. The other guy sits down and does nothing all day. Okay, and you both get paid, say, uh, $10,000 a month, okay? Or uh, you both get paid out of a pool of $10,000 a month, so you get 5000 each, right? You're going to work 45, uh, 65 hours a week sometimes, sometimes an extra 20, 20 hours a week. And he, you know, sits around and works maybe five, six hours a day. Do you both deserve to get paid the same? Of course not. Okay, well, then not if not. you don't, the boss recognizes it, then from a meritorious perspective, you rise up and he falls down. The reason is you deserve to rise up and he's falling down because he's not earning his keep. That is a socioeconomic shift because one is actually earning their keep more than the other. Now... The reason why that nine-year-old girl in Sri Lanka does not, would not necessarily get her fair share is because there are barriers, there are artificial friction points that prevent her from um, excelling from a meritorious perspective. She doesn't have the same access as a guy that went to West Point and is graduated from West Point or Harvard and graduated from our uh, works at Goldman Sachs prop desk. She um, doesn't have the same initial capital the same education, et cetera. So these friction points take a lot of the meritorious argument out of the equation, and the, that's where these glass ceilings come from. Again, removing these friction points, these glass ceilings allow for true capitalism, true survival of the fittest. And I believe in capitalism, and I believe in survival of the fittest. And that doesn't mean putting somebody else down. That means pushing yourself up. Okay. Uh... I'm gonna add. I'm gonna add something in here since I'm reading uh, the post, and if if I may, uh, maybe even answer it. Uh, be more followed up with. So if I grow and do better for myself, or if I make more money, I'm taking money and food from someone else. And if I can, Reggie, please correct me uh, if I'm wrong. That's not really what's being said. Bottom line is, if if you look at even a traditional business, there's a finite amount of capital or resources to be allocated. Uh, it's only logical that those of us that strive to do more set ourselves up to do better, not to denigrate someone else, but simply because that is our position and how we move. We would not only expect uh, to be compensated more for that, but that's simply logical in the, in the way of business. As a matter of fact, if you wanted to be truly honest with the definition of capitalism, when it's actually applied uh, where it's supposed to, that's the way it's supposed to go. And then and, and then it was followed up with, well, that sounds like social Darwinism, survival of the fittest. Social Darwinism was used to explain and uh, prove black inferiority. Once again, uh, I, I disagree with that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to table that because that takes us kind of off the subject, the focus of the subject that we're here on, uh, because basically when we come back to the leveraging of the technology to break down those barriers, which simply says now that we're on an e even playing field, the little girl in Sri Lanka can leverage her, her intellectual capital to advance her position because she is no longer blocked from uh, access, as Reggie discussed, 
as a lot of people are based on the way the system is set up now. And if I'm understanding you correctly, Reggie, the Bitcoin technology is the technology that would be used to leverage putting us down on that even playing field. And then it's up to you to advance yourself however you choose to. It, it, interject wherever I'm wrong, but it, 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 am I... Am I putting it in layman's terms, maybe? You got it right. Just like the internet has leveled the playing field in communications, where before the internet, you had, uh, or before the proliferation, a popular proliferation of the internet, you had bastions of alleged um, intel intel intelligentsia, and they decided what was right, what was wrong, what was fact. When I grew up, when I was my daughters, they have three children, 10, 15, and 24, when I was 10 years old, my daughter's age, um, the concept of an encyclopedia was Encyclopedia Britannica or Encyclopedia Americana. This stuff cost $600, $800. This is in 1970-something dollars. So you're talking several thousand dollars easily now. And it was written by a small group of people, none of which looked like me, sounded like me, grew up in my environment, or maybe even appreciated my attributes. And that was considered fact. That's what we learned about. My daughter thinks of Encyclopedia as Wikipedia. You know, Wikipedia is written by many people. Now, a lot of the contributors to Wikipedia are still from certain socioeconomic demographics, but it's significantly broader than what Encyclopedia Britannica or Americana was. Um, and it covers many more aspects. I have a very large Wikipedia page, you know, of which I didn't write myself, but entities from all over the world. It started from Ireland, believe it or not. And contributors from all over the world said, Reggie Middleton is someone who should be in an encyclopedia, and they've contributed all types of uh, information and attributes. Now, not all of it was positive. And not all of it was necessarily something I agree with or true, but a lot of it that wasn't true was counteracted by other um, contributors. This uh, purer form of democracy, okay, was just wasn't available when I was a child. You know, what? date myself you're talking about 40 years ago it simply wasn't available that is because access was given to a much broader set of contributors everybody could be a contributor and that's with information imagine what happens when the same broadening of access is given to value you know it's a whole different program a whole different ball game basically any intermediator gets disintermediated any middleman gets removed Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, everybody. Even the so-called disruptors will be disrupted. Um, our technology allows you not only to take a bank out of the equation, but we could take Uber out of the equation. Uber, which is a very good idea, I was wondering why I didn't think of it. You know, they take a commodity devices, smartphones, which everybody in the U.S. and big cities have, with GPS location services, which is free, and everybody has that uses any Google product. And they use it to leverage communicating uh, with the leverage the communication between a passenger and the delivery car driver. And they choose the delivery industry because it is the most inefficient and backwards technology and capable industry there is. Lots of friction, high prices, very low service. You know, Uber came in, they disintermediated things, they dropped prices, increased service, pissed off the government regulators, and no drivers. But Uber is still a middleman. OK, using things that everybody already has. If everybody already has the technology and Uber is a middleman and you have peer to peer technology, such as the Bitcoin blockchain, why do you need a middleman? So you use smart contracts and peer to peer technology. Now, Peter, the driver, could be contacted directly by Paul um, through the blockchain and they could agree on a destination and a price with a small contract in real time. Uber is cut out. And that 30 percent that Uber takes it be split 15% to the driver, 15% to the uh, um, passenger. You can also disintermediate Airbnb, Visa, MasterCard, Amazon, eBay. It's a whole new world once people realize what the technology is capable of, and that's our job. We're working on a decent sized funding, um, over $25 million. If we get that, then I'd say at least 4 or $5 million will go pure education from large institutions to the grassroots level on up. Education is the key here. Now with education being the key, and I know you're talking sometime down the, you know, 
a little bit further down the road, is there things that we can do now that can educate folks? Because like I said, before we had this conversation, you know, today, we could only spell Bitcoin. So okay. is there any way to, to, I guess, expedite spreading that word? Well, there, there's a funny big part. media for the education and realize that popular media, the pop media, mainstream media, um, their business model has nothing to do with education. They don't get paid for getting facts and shivering it into your face. They get paid by advertising, primarily. Very few of them even charge subscription fees. So if they get paid by advertising, the more people that come by and look at something, the longer they look at it, you know, the more money they make. So instead of pushing fact, which means only fact seekers seek it, a very, very small contingent of our society, they make things bombastic and they make things tabloidal. So when they discuss Bitcoin, instead of discussing, you know, risk-free transfers and the democratization of access to value, they talk about the child porn peddler or the you know, pedophile or the drug dealer or the hitman, et cetera, that use Bitcoin to get paid. And yes, they do do it. But, you know, in terms of currencies, which currency has the largest uh, um, demographic of criminals using it, if you had to take a guess today? That would easily be the dollar. <laughs> number two. But, talking about number two, number two would probably be the euro. Number three, the yen, number four, the pound, mm -hmm. number five, the Swiss franc or the Chinese, remember, you are. So where's Bitcoin have to do with all this? Nothing. Okay. So instead of focusing on a small contingent, focus on what it does. So the way I recommend anybody who's listening to learn about Bitcoin, go speak to the source. The primary um, premise of Bitcoin is openness. You could go to the original white paper written by Satoshi Nakamoto, which is still sitting on the internet. You could read his initial law uh, introduction. You could read, go to the Bitcoin Wiki. You could read that, basically what it was meant to do. It's evolved a lot since then. And if you want to know one person's perspective, but a very objective perspective, because I don't have, uh, you know, a dog in this fight outside of succeeding with my own personal pursuits, which is technology agnostic, because I'm much more of a strategist of the technologist. You can follow me. Um, I leave my Facebook page open to everybody. I, I recently just stopped friending people on my personal page because you know, a few weirdos will follow me. But go to Reggie Middleton's public Facebook page and just click follow. You can follow me at Twitter, at Reggie Middleton, and, um, or LinkedIn. And I give my opinion daily when I wake up in the morning, both on global events, technology, finance, social, and socioeconomic, and particularly on... Um, what I call macro tech now, macro technology and global macronics, but most other people refer to it as fintech. Um, I believe what we're doing is too big to be considered fintech because this technology affects everything. The reason why I went through uh, uh, the finance industry first because it was low hanging fruit. You know, with all due respect to all my buddies in finance, the guys are drastically overpaid. You know, to run money and make eight hundred million dollars a year or twenty million dollars a year and contribute to society no more and not even as much as your typical third grade teacher who does well at her job means that there's a significant imbalance, you know, and what you can pay versus your contribution to the world. This technology is going to even that out because now these guys can still get paid a lot, but they really, really have to do something versus standing in the middle of Peter and Paul and grabbing a piece of the dollar when they pass it through. Okay. Yep. I, I know you've got to run. So I want to thank you again, but uh, we would love to have you back because I do have other questions on, on other economic areas like precious metals and things like that um, outside of Bitcoin that I would love to talk to you about or, you know, love for you to share your opinion on. Um, so just let us know. You're always welcome back, Reggie. Fellow Bison, uh, keep doing what you're doing. Keep sharing all that you're sharing. I greatly appreciate it. Thanks to everybody who, you know, joined us here. Um this is recorded. Um, I'll make sure you get a copy of it, Reggie. But I want to thank you again, man. I greatly appreciate it. Please do. I posted on my Facebook. I know how to get into Blab. 
Um, I'll promote it and we'll see if we get a large crowd coming in. That'll work. Thanks a lot, Reg. Uh, hopefully, we get to see you uh, this fall sometime. See you all, possibly. Once again, thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.